Hello and a very warm welcome to another session with the Change Exchange. And my guest today, Louise Carver, folk rock singer songwriter, um, string of hits <laughs> to her name, both singles and albums, and both here and in Europe and in the States. You've just had a huge success in, in the United States. <laughs> yes, I thank you for having me. Um, I have, uh, earlier this year, had my second number one billboard chart hit on the club dance charts, which um, is pretty special for me. You That's get the plaque, the whole Louise. tooth bag. Yeah. Because it's really, then you're mm. out there on the world stage. You're yeah. competing with everyone. Yeah, we actually knocked, the first time I did it, I knocked Rihanna off the charts. Uh, <laughs> and then this time it's Demi Lovato. So um, it feels great. And what also is lovely uh, with the billboard charts is that it's done properly. There's no um, Question thumb marks. sucking. It's mm. pure stats that they oh. with how many plays, how much streaming. So it's purely quantity of how many times you've, your song has mm. played. Um, and that, that pushes you up or down the charts. So it feels good to be in a system that is really monitored well. No, fantastic. And this from someone who spent the first about 10 years of your life mostly in bed because of asthma. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I've actually just recovered from, from flu, so uh, I don't often get asthma anymore, but it was up until about 12, I um, struggled to breathe most of my life on cortisone. Um, and I think that made me an introvert just through yeah. the fact I couldn't really do sport or much because of my breathing and forced me on the piano because I couldn't really go outside um, and reading. So yeah. I think that I became a good lyricist from reading so much. Yeah. And um, the one thing I could do is play the piano. That, yeah. Could you? Because your piano teacher fired you when you were 10. Did <laughs> you have a lot of information? <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> Yes, yeah, see, I have a very, um, I was composing from about 11, so I haven't, it's funny to think back uh, on your personality, but I, I don't ever mean to be rude or dismissive, but I've got a, a strong personality in a quiet way, and I think a very free spirit, and I didn't like the way she was, I didn't like the discipline of it. I already, I don't know how you know this, but my soul knew how to play the piano and I knew how to write. So she did not want to practice your scales. So she fired me from her class. <laughs> I didn't want to. Do, I got to grade four and I thought, I've got this. I don't need you, lady. With your coffee breath <laughs> breathing on me and my ruler on my hand. So she let me go, and from there I started writing. Um, composing lots. Um, I just remember my older sister always slamming doors, shut up! Um, and, uh, and then at 15 I started a band and uh, also opera training with a, a quite a renowned Cape Townian opera singer, Wendy Fine. And um, you had an unexpected break soon after that, you were just 15. Yeah, I um, put a little band together, as a lot of teenagers do, uh, but I happened to have a bass player whose father had started an independent record label in Camps Bay, hadn't really signed anyone yet, um, and I went to go and play in the garage <laughs> where they had some musical instruments, and I never used a mic before because I was opera trained, and got on and started playing this song, and... Uh, the owner's girlfriend heard me and brought him down. Reluctantly, he didn't really want to come down. And um, oh, he, it's just kids. Yeah, really. And he was watching rugby, and he was grumpy in his pajamas. And and I played a song for him, not thinking anything. And from then on, he took me under his wing. And it was two years of playing terrible. There was one place I played called Steamers every Wednesday um, on the N2. My mum would drive me there in a jeep and we would do that and get me back and get to school. So he really tested me. We did photo shoots to see if I was photogenic. He didn't just put his money behind me. He really made me do some terrible gigs. Um, and that's the way it should be. Mm. And then when I was 17, uh, I remember... Can I ask, how yes. did you experience that as a 16-year-old mm. to actually be in front of an audience and trying to find a response, getting one or not getting one? <laughs> What was that like? Everything seemed so natural. It felt like this is my journey and felt like I, I, I was just doing what I was supposed to be doing. I, I didn't question it. Um, mm. I didn't go like, it was just very natural. Um, I'm quite an introvert, but when I'm on stage, it's not um, like I'm a big performer. I'm a small, authentic performer on a piano, but it's, it's storytelling for me and um, 
And it worked for it the worked. first time it for worked. you. I yeah. Mean. yeah, I didn't. I didn't think. What am I doing? Mm. I just thought, well, this is what I do. And then the first hit. Um, that was strange. Not the fact that it was a hit. Um, it was strange people's reactions. My friends and I was in matric. So when you're a young girl, 17, all you want to do is be included in parties and fit um, in. and fit in. I just wanted to fit in. I've never fit in, and I've tried. I've given up now. Um, but they didn't tell me they were releasing it. It was during my uh, September exams, and my mum and the record label decided we're not going to tell her, which we had was good and bad. Good that I could focus on my exams. <clears throat> bad that I was not prepared. So I went to school on the day of writing Krune and Boss. <laughs> and uh, an Afrikaans was tough for me, coming from British parents. So I was really working hard, and I got there, and schoolgirls said, we heard your song on 5FM. And I didn't even know they had released it, so I was very unprepared. Mm. And then going into first year varsity, I was treated a bit like a freak. So I'd be waiting at the canteen, and people would say, that's that girl. <laughs> and then I'd turn around to go like, hi. And then it was like, so uh, it took a while to adjust. And I think it was very normal for me. The song did very well. It all felt normal, the career side, but the people's reaction was a bit lonely. But still, you went to university, mm. you got your mm. honours in PPE, PPE yeah. politics, philosophy, economics. Uh, why did you feel that you still wanted the formal education? Um, it's what my family values most, oh. uh, and still. So, uh, so that I wanted was to please them. Accepted thing. That yeah. is what one does. But I was already mm. interested in philosophy. Um, I was quite a loner, and my mom gave me uh, uh, many books. Uh, I think, therefore, I am Descartes or Descartes. Or, um, and I would read them. And the owner of the record label also was big into education. So he said, We can handle this both. We'll back off when it's your exam times, and then we'll push you when it's not. And they did that. So I was there for four years. And you were lucky to time. find someone like that. Yeah, with, I was very lucky. such understanding and so supportive. Yeah, he actually said, you need to do the PPE degree. I've researched it. It's the one coming out of Oxford. And I was the first group of 12 to do it at UCT under Don Ross, who was our mm. dean then. And it hadn't been introduced before. But it was a great degree to do. And I loved it. I had the best time. And after six months on campus, people just got over it. Mm. They could see I had no ego. I was just another um, student, another student, mm. just doing my thing. And at Hoppus too, finished varsity uh, political studies and then got on my little Volkswagen Beetle and went to the studio and worked till one in the evening. And that was my life. Sure. But I yeah. loved it. Mm. And when you're young, you have so much energy. <laughs> you can't believe it. Uh, then you go out partying at one and then crawl back into, I had to do accounts, I think, first year, accounts 101. And then you do it all again. And it's so easy, but it changes. You lose a bit of energy. And you <laughs> said that uh, one of the highlights of your career for you is the traveling. The, the, such different places um, from taverns in red light districts <laughs> to um, St. Petersburg yeah. theaters. Um, tell me a little bit about that and that exposure. Um, well, I have to thank my dance music, which was such a curveball for me because it wasn't the plan. The plan is singer, songwriter, um, intensely honest to a listening crowd. Well, um, at 21, I flew to London and I spent many years in London trying to get that career going. But what kept giving me number ones, I had uh, two <clears throat> in Europe at the time, I'd uh, play the game and I'd say yes, was dance music. I kept coming in the path of DJs that would give me their instrumental tracks with no lyrics or melody and say, do something with this. So I was working, but not in the genre that I thought. And then it was, became really successful. So I started getting deals with Sony um, in the UK with dance music. And still to this day, it's the dance music that takes me all over the world. Um, the States, Russia, <clears throat> Belgium, London. Um, and it's fun. It's fun. It's, a, it's like having two creative personalities. Because when I'm on stage with my grand piano and my beautiful dress, and I've got the cellist behind me, that's lovely. That is where my heart's at. But sometimes when I'm performing two huge festivals in New York or Boston, like I was two years ago, and in casinos, I just think, oh, who would have thought, you know, I'm in my 30s, it's two in the morning, there's this heaving crowd of teenagers, I'm throwing luminous things in there going, how's everybody doing? I'm Louise Carr from South Africa. Woo! And I think, this is so fun. Uh, so I don't take it very, 
it's it's my um, as Joe Bermuda's in the States said, oh, forget you got an alter ego. Like I come and I put my little short shorts on, and I thought <laughs> this is unexpected and it's quite fun. I don't yeah. take it so seriously. Yeah. That's I think that's also why it's done so well. It's a real life lesson when you just throw things out with joy, um, and you're not so micromanaging. It actually does very well. Some why of the time. did you decide to go to London? In the beginning, <clears throat> I thought it was the next step. My, I've got a British passport. My sister was already there, and I thought, well, to get my music to the next level, a bigger, I must bigger go. world, bigger yeah, stage. I must go there. I've already got family, so it wasn't so frightening. And um, I did get a break. I met a photographer in South Africa who said you need to go and speak to Kenny Hawkes because he was a British photographer. I did. I made Play the Game, which was this huge dance track. Um, Still gives me great royalties, just sit back, and, and it just took off. It was an unusual, strange... I wrote it about my time working in a nightclub um, when I was 18, next to Blue's Restaurant in Camps Bay. And it was me just saying, hi, good evening, sir, can I show you through to your table? <laughs> and just watching the dynamic between men and women trying to pick each other up in bars, so it's called Play the Game. Um, and then from there, I got Dutch Investor investing in my um, second album called Silent Scream. And then we were doing deals for three years with Universal uh, International. And they said, to properly sign you in, the protocol is that South Africa, because you are South African, South Africa Universal needs to sign you first. And then we'll send an email saying, we're going to pick you up internationally. And um, it was all happening. People are already sending me congratulations. And so, like the 11th hour, the uh, MD of uh, Universal at the time went, in South Africa went, we're not signing her. She's not on our list of people to sign in this country. And after three years of going to lunches with the international guys, really slumming it in London, they just turned me down. I thought it was that I had gone on holiday thinking, I'm in. I'm now going to be picked up by Universal International and they'll work it. They couldn't do anything about it because South Africa refused to sign me. And the next week, Sony South Africa signed me. And so, that's why I moved back to South Africa. And we released Empty Fantasy. And that went to number one. And but you say it so easily. That's why I moved back to South Africa. But that was a huge, we talk about change moments. Yeah. That was a huge hinge moment. Hmm? I know, but it was moving fast. So I yes. didn't have, it wasn't like I was sitting there for a year going, no one wants to sign me. I was signed the next week. So it was, and, and then the song went. And then. So there was an impetus driving it. And then it money the started to come for the first time in my life. I've been so poor until, um, and my dad has this, philosophy that at 21 fly free little birdie and that's it everything's cut off everything so he paid even university up to 21 i wanted to do another year of my honors and he said well go get a loan um so that's his way of doing it which thinking back i look at a lot of my peers and people younger and they have been given a lot more um, and I think it's made me very like, you've got to make this work because you haven't got... You always said you can come mm. back for food and shelter, but that's <laughs> it. Um, yeah. And I don't so mind really that. self-reliant. Really go, and I am. Mm. I, you can put me anywhere and I will make it happen. Um, and I like that about myself. But um, it, it, Sony signed me, Empty Fantasy just shot up the charts. And then I got a manager for the first time. Um, and then he started booking me corporates. And you know how that is. Mm. Suddenly, I've got money, so I didn't mind moving back. I actually could buy my first 42 square meter apartment in Hurlingham, and jo I moved to Joburg, um, and it was mine. It was my first little apartment, and I was happy. I was happy. Mm. I always say it was the best of times and the worst of times, to quote Charles Dickens, because um, it was bad. I had been engaged uh, for five years with a man that was a bipolar, coke addict, and opened a gentleman's club and it was just a crazy world and that had ended and it's all I kind of knew in my 20s so then I was on my own in Joburg with no friends except a band that if we weren't playing they were with their girlfriends or their wives but it was the best of times because I learned about myself yeah. and I always want to build a new network hard for me yes. it was very hard um, now I I can say I've been in Joburg for 10 years <clears throat> and and I have slowly, huh? slow. it takes time. Well, one, you can, one thinks that it will happen within six months, but it doesn't. Oh, you've always got social engagements. It's Joburg. You've always got dinner parties, but where you can crash on a friend's couch and go like, oh, the worst day ever. Yes. That takes years. Yes. Um, 
so and and yeah, it was it was lonely, but it's not an unfamiliar feeling. I heard Trevor mm. Noah once say that, you know, he's used to being the outcast, and I'm used to being lonely. So it's not such a foreign feeling. It feels lovely when I'm not lonely. But I've travelled so extensively around the world on my own. When they say we don't, there's no budget for a manager or an agent, I'm going anyway. That's what mm. they said in Russia. When I went to Russia for a week, my agent said, "You're not going to St. Petersburg on your own." I was like, "I am. I'm going. I'm not missing this experience." No one spoke English, and I was there for a week. And one, like interpreter, who was about 21, who could do the odd word, but I was in silence pretty much for a week, and it was great. I saw a drug deal go down. Right, I had tinted windows in a Range Rover, and I was sitting right there, just doing my scales to warm up in a club at two in the morning. Like no one, no one's going to notice, but I'm a professional, and. Um, <clears throat> they didn't see me, and they just this in Russia. First night I was there, they did a whole coke deal in front of the in front of me. But they, I thought, just slide down the seat. <laughs> no, Louise, and and now what's what's going on? What's next? Yo, um, well, I think uh, a lot is happening in the states for me, so I need to spend more time there. Um, a lot more shows and live performances. You said that you spend two months of the year there, yeah. anyway. Yeah, mm. so that's gonna somehow increase or we'll work that out. Um, I have also got an events company called Evergreen Events. So what happened was, I always say I out-niched myself. I'm too niche for myself because I'm not an Opikopi festival no. and I'm not a band. And so I was getting booked a lot for corporates, um, but not connecting with fans anymore. So the money was great, but you don't get that feeling of you singing to people that have collected your albums over the years and it's it felt empty so um i thought well i can't just sit around and wait for someone to book me um i'm going to just form organize evergreen it, events organize and it organize yourself. it myself so i've done mm. it for the last two years and it's been very successful i've done joint ventures with appropriate venues around south africa that have the outdoor feel with family and um and it's done very well for me so i'm happy with that and I've got i saw you did one in january um near ramones on yes. one of the one of Stanford the wine hills farms. yeah yes i did that and i invited art matthews from just ginger and the years before i invited watershed so i do a nice combo of adult contemporary similar style music mm. um so fans can really get you know a, Double what they, you know, what they would see if they're not just seeing one artist, they get to see two. That they know all the music, so we play all the hits and we combine it. And I work out the shows, so that's been going well. Mm. And I have a jewelry business, Louise Carver Collection. I've got a yeah, shop in Parkhurst. So how that's did that cool. come into being? You, you said <coughs> that so quickly. She makes jewelry. <laughs> I do, <laughs> <laughs> and I import, so not everything. Uh, when I was in New York, um, I was in Chelsea. So the story happened when I was uh, ten years ago. I realized and looked at who, my, who are the people that come to watch me. And it's not your cap buying, vest buying, Louise Carver on the vest. That's, so that's fine for bands like Prime Circle and uh, you know, all the other bands, but I'm not that. So what, am I, what do they want? So I thought, well, jewelry would be a lovely thing if they could have a piece of beautiful jewelry from, from the show and remember it that way, something different. So I uh, spoke to wholesalers around South Africa and um, firstly only worked with pearls and then I realized that's not everyone's cup of tea. And I've, mm. I've extended it to work with Turkey and China and then I still try and work with South African manufacturers. And then two years ago I was in New York staying in, uh, opposite Chelsea Market and it's all handcrafted there and uh, jewelry from these unique designers. And I just did deals with who I thought would work. So I'm actually oh. wearing one of them. So, so this, so they, they like pan make the gold. So it's, it's a lovely side business that um, I enjoy. It's feminine, soft, and when I perform, there's a lovely girl that has it for me all on the table, and and I have a little shop in Parker. So mm. nice, mm. nice, nice projects. Well, music is always the main thing, um, and I've got a lot of international projects on the go. And I finished my, I think it's my sixth studio album, so I'm, I'm, I'm resting. There's no plans yet to make another album. It takes a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. So I think I need to get the songs right first, because everything's about the song. If you don't have the song, don't, you can't polish a turd. <laughs> <laughs> it needs to be a good, good song first. Um, you referred to <clears throat> a very unhappy relationship. Um, mm -hmm. Was that the one that was also <clears throat> quite abusive? Um, I've been in several. Um, I would say three. 
Um, the last one being by far the most damaging. Um, you know, I think people find it so difficult to understand. Here are you, self-reliant, independent, adult, um, and yet you get drawn into a situation where someone <clears throat> is in a position of so much power over you. How does it happen? I think I always thought that I had um, very high self-esteem because the media kind of tells you <laughs> and uh, I was up on stage, was my feedback was great, we like you, then I must like me too. Um, so I, I think for entertainers, a lot of us suffer from this. We believe the hype that we are awesome, we're doing so well. <clears throat> and um, it was only through the last relationship of three years when I realized something was really, really wrong. Um, and I uh, sort of my mother. And so I ended up in, um, after having an intervention from a therapist that... Um, Sorry, but if you say <coughs> you only realized very slowly, how does that happen? Because, I mean, what did he do to you, if I may be specific? Yes. Um, well, it's a, it's, he was a narcissist. Um, so people don't know what a narcissist is. They think it's just a Kim Kardashian figure kind of looking at themselves in the mirror and posing. Um, selfies. That's not. That's a small, small little aspect of nar a certain type of narcissist. A narcissist is somebody with zero empathy, very similar to the behavioral traits of a sociopath and psychopath. So they have no ability to think about anybody else or have empathy for anybody else. They're totally about their needs they t and how they get them. So they see people as um, a means to an end. A means to an end. And they don't so they, have the facility to see it in any other way. They cannot change. It's so how I'm sure they can be very charming because that Incredibly is the means charming. to the end. In, yeah. So they have to do that act. It's called the love bombing stage. And that's two to six months. Mine was very short because they hate sharing the limelight. Trump is a, obviously a classic example of a narcissist. When he's not in the limelight, he's not a very nice person. So when you date me, you've got to understand most of my life, I'm in the limelight. With, and the funny thing is, I didn't really care about it, but it comes with what I do. <clears throat> and uh, so two so months in, uh, I had my Joe Berg album launch. And uh, that was the first signs of it. Um, he jumped out of him. I was driving him back. I had said, no, I'm fine to drive. I hadn't had a chance to drink. I was doing all the media because he told me to get a taxi or an Uber. I said, no, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. I've got all my gear in the back. I can't just leave it. And he sulked, and then we got to a robot on Jan Smuts, and he just jumped out of the car. And I said, what are you doing? And this was about 2 in the morning. Got him to come back in the car, drove him to his, he was staying with his parents in the spare room, driving his mother's car. These were all big signs. Hmm. But um, he broke up with me the next day, and I left for Russia, and then started hoovering me. That's the next thing. So they're testing you the whole time. Right? It's too, sh it's very complicated, but, but they how did he, sense. How did he harm you? <clears throat> did, so he, did he harm you physically? He did in the end. He did break my toe um, <laughs> uh, and uh, laughed in front of my brother um, and uh, told my brother she's just milking it. Um, but that was the end, and it was going physical. But luckily, I had an intervention. So what happens is, as I, as I was explaining to you earlier, it's like they put a little drop of, I say, arsenic in your tea every morning. So you don't even realize they're pushing your boundaries. They're checking your boundaries. They're having massive rages. They're keeping a chaotic environment. Then they're incredibly loving. And it's, it's, your brain looks the same as um, an addict of heroin. That's what the mm -hmm. therapist told me. There's no difference between your brain because right it now. it goes up and down. So <clears throat> you are you know, absolutely, yes. Down. Um, they they gaslight you, so you think you're going mad. They'll say, yeah. I told you that. You see, the problem with you, Ruder, is you don't listen. It's, and he would say, it's not the Louise Carver show. Not everything is about you. And all I'd say was, I don't remember you said you were going to see your ex-girlfriend for lunch. Um, I'm sure I would have remembered that. Yeah, you see, again, it's all about you. So it was coming aggressive yeah. every day. And then you actually think, it is all about me. I am a horrible person. <laughs> they wait for you to at four in the morning to reveal your insecurities. Maybe your mum said something hurtful to you when you were a kid and you say, I'm really sensitive about that. They're gathering all that information. Um, 
They use you for your status. In my case, he was absolutely bum. Um, he had no money. He was blacklisted. He had been to jail for fraud. Why did you fall for him? Very good looking, very <laughs> charming. I was very lonely. I had lots of friends, but I dated very inappropriate, wealthy, older, you know, the social scene that us get put into. Those are the only people I was meeting. So I met this refreshing camel man kind of outdoors guy. And I thought, this is perfect. This is actually how I was raised. I'm a girl that likes to go on adventures and I don't want to be put in a little box and mm. put a little gown on and play on the piano and then get put back. I'm actually, I want to have an adventure and I'm ready for it now. And I chose the wrong person. So it's, it's you, yeah. you said that, that you did have therapy afterwards. What, mm. what did you learn? So much. I learned that um, I confused self-efficiency, the belief in the ability of yourself to get a, um, a job done mm -hmm. with um, self-worth. I, th I have very high belief in myself um, in tasks. Tell Louise Carver to do something. It will happen. happen. It's going to happen and it's going to be brilliant and before the deadline because that's how I work. And then they'll go, Louise is so clever. I'm like, yes, it's like stroking the doggy. But like, you're like, yeah, I did. That's, I'm A-type. I'm very efficient. Um, but when she got down to it, I had very low self-esteem. I didn't think I deserved. I thought, I actually, why would anybody want to be with me? They're only with me because I'm famous. Um, or that I sing well. Or I've got a <clears throat> nice house or whatever. That's what I thought deep, deep down in your, you know, in your most honest self. And we had to work on that. And it's, um, unfortunately, most of it comes from your childhood. Mm. So... Yeah, it's a, it's a long way to go back. It's painful. And initially, you um, you don't want to go there. You're fiercely protective of your clan. And that's how you're taught to be as well. You're taught. You do not throw any family member under the bus. And so she had to break through that first. Mm -hmm. And I said, we're here to talk about my ex, not my mother and not my father. She said, okay, he's just a symptom <laughs> of that. So we need to. And eventually we did. And, and I was very angry. And then you have to come full circle and go, mm. parents are people. Mm. They did the best they could with the knowledge that they had. You know, every parent is going to make By a mistake. By the lights they were given. Exactly. And, and think, the circumstances, yeah, yeah exactly, that yeah. they came out of. Yeah. My parents came out of Second World War in England. Um, my dad believes if you can put a roof over your head and feed you, his job is done. And I think a lot of dads mm. felt that at that time. Talking about a roof over your head, where's yours and what does it look like? <laughs> oh, um, I'm very happy. In the, I'm not going to be specific. I've had a few issues with stalkers over the years. So I'm just going to say I'm happy in Joburg in the northern suburbs. I live near a beautiful park. I have three dogs. And I'm very happy in a new relationship and somebody totally different to anybody I've dated before. Um, I think I've got it right this time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, and I'm very happy in Joburg. I and love when it. You, um, you say that, I mean, you grew up in Cape Town. Mm. You lived there until you were 22, 3. Why Joburg now? Um, I think I grew up in Joburg. I think it's a city that, obviously, I didn't grow up in Joburg, but I grew up. I yeah. um, became, I became who I'm, I, I became an adult in Joburg. Mm -hmm. And I like how... Um, open we are as a city to new people. Cape Town's very close and that always oh, that just frustrates me. I like um, how social we are, that there are things going on and that people don't just sit at home. And um, I like that if you have an idea, there's enough money in the city to for someone to come along and back your idea and you can grow it. Um, and you will probably find someone who will, will be interested. Yeah, and they're not going to have a meeting about a meeting that they're going to have. That's Cape Town. Um, and <laughs> Cape Town is smoke and mirrors for me. It's, it's beautiful. We all know that. But actually, if you're a working person that's career driven, it's a very tough city to, to be in. Whereas Joburg is like, right, let's do this. Look, it's, it's not always amazing. It's not the prettiest city. But I live um, near Delta Park with mm. the Cosmos out. And I think it's pretty nice for a city. And I spent quite a bit of time in New York. And I think it holds its own as a city. I think. Um, you know, Central Park is obviously beautiful, but we've got Emerentia and Del I think mm. it's got a lot to offer. And I like how um, we are very uh, not segregated. And that's very important to me. I find Cape Town is still very divided in where people choose to live. And I don't know how 
you're supposed to learn about each other living so separate from each other. So that doesn't interest me. And when I came to Joburg, I wrote Warrior with Zulu Boy. And that was my way of going like, yes, and we have, I'm living in more of the city that represents who I am. And um, the song is, as a musician, this is, this is more who I am. So, yeah. Louise, thank you so much. And I hope you will be very, very happy in your <laughs> new relationship. Thank and you. And that Joburg has so, been so good to us. Yes. So uh, I yeah. hope. It will be, well, 10 years, you're already a Joe Burger. Yeah, I am. I think it's nine years is the, it's your like, Cut off. yes, you're in. Finally. No, but I think that's Cape Town. Joe is like, you're in. It's cool. We'll have yeah. you. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. All of the very best. Thank you for joining us. Um, until the next time, goodbye.